Good morning and welcome to the Interdenominational Theological Center, which we fondly refer to as the ITC. You're uh, viewing across the country and internationally this very special chapel event. Hi, I'm Joseph Evans and I serve as the Dean of the Morehouse School of Religion. And I am have the privilege of being the host uh, for this 2020 Gardner C. Taylor Lecture Series. Now, let me first uh, tell you that our theme is what does the prophet proclaim during the aftertimes, pandemic, politics, and paranoia? Now, we took a biblical text from Jeremiah chapter 25 and 32. Uh, we are not, however, uh, trying to constrain uh, our participants precisely to that text. We want to hear free flow and we're looking forward to it. Now, I have the privilege of introducing to us the panel uh, host and moderator and a few of the others who will be a part of this very special service. Let me begin by letting us all uh, welcome uh, virtually uh, Dr. Cynthia Hale, uh, the senior pastor of the Ray of Hope Christian Church in Decatur, Georgia. And she is one of the premier preachers in our country today. And she's going to introduce her panel members. It is also my privilege to uh, introduce Dr. Reverend, Reverend Dr. Johnny Flakes III, who's the esteemed pastor of the Fourth Street Church uh, in Columbus, Georgia. He'll be delivering the Gardner Taylor sermon uh, that uh, will follow us. And then we will hear from none other than the great Reverend Dr. Jeremiah Wright, Jr. And we are privileged to have him to deliver for us our annual lecture. Let me now uh, make an appeal to all of us to recognize our president, President Williams, Matthew Williams. We thank you, your cabinet, your staff, uh, our faculty, our students, and our ITC alum at large. Very special thank you to Nancy, Nancy Jones, and to your. Uh, Institutional Advancement Team, thank you so much for the support uh, that you've provided in a very spectacular and professional way. And lastly, I'm going to make an appeal to you that at the appropriate time, you're gonna see scrolling across our screens uh, opportunities for you to contribute financially uh, to the Interdenominational Theological Center. Let me say this, there are only about four schools uh, in the country that offers a master's degree and above that is set aside uh, principally for African-American seminarians, four. And we're asking you to support all of them, but particularly today, Interdenominational Theological Center. So when that opportunity comes, I ask you to give liberally as we educate the next generations of pulpiteers and parachurch ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now bow your head with me. Gracious God, we thank you so much for being with us during this period of time. We ask that you would bless this country at large. There are crises. There are delusional people that are in, uh, have the reins of power. We know that, oh God, that you are sovereign and that your hand strengthens us who are on the margins. Now bless the panel members as they start this lecture series, the 2020 lecture series. And in your name, we ask it. And for his sake, amen. amen. It's my privilege now again. Dr. Hale is coming and we want to hear what she has to say. Dean Evans, thank you so much for this amazing opportunity to participate in this conversation during the 2020 Gardner C. Taylor lecture series. President Matthew Williams, Vice President of Institutional Advancement, Nancy Jones, Cabinet, faculty, staff, students, alums, and all of you who are with us today virtually in the audience, my brothers and sisters. I'm excited to be joined by two major preaching women, Dr. Gina Marcia Stewart and Dr. R. Janae Pitts Murdoch. Both of these pastors have extensive bios, but let me just share a few highlights with you. The Reverend Dr. Gina Marcia Stewart is the senior pastor of the Christ Missionary Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee. Dr. Stewart earned a Bachelor of Business in, 
of Business Administration in Marketing from the University of Memphis, a Master of Education in Administration and Supervision from Trebekah Nazarene College in Nashville, Tennessee, and the Master of Divinity degree from Memphis Theological Seminary. Dr. Stewart also attended the Harvard Divinity School Summer Leadership Institute for Church-Based Community and Economic Development and received the Doctor of Ministry degree from ITC <laughs> in 2007. She is currently pursuing a PhD in African American preaching at Christian Theological Seminary in Indianapolis, Indiana. You also know that she had the distinction of being the morning preacher for the Hampton Ministers Conference in June 2009 and the conference preacher for the Hampton Ministers Conference in 20, June 2011. She is currently a visiting professor of practical theology for the Samuel DeWitt Proctor School of Theology at Virginia Union University serves as a member of the NAACP board and as the first vice president for the Lot Carey Foreign Mission Convention. Reverend R. Janae Pitts Murdoch is a graduate of the University of Michigan Ann Arbor with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Communication Studies, Carnegie Mellon University with a Master of Science degree in Public Policy and Management United Theological Seminary with a Master of Divinity degree and University of Memphis with a Master of Business Administration. These sisters are deep. <laughs> she is currently a candidate for the Doctor of Philosophy in African American Preaching and Sacred Rhetoric at Christian Theological Seminary. Pastor Pitts Murdoch served in the U.S. Department of the Army as a U.S. Presidential Management Intern and later as a Logistics Management Specialist. She was employed at the Pentagon during the September 11, 2001 attacks. Pastor Pitts Murdoch currently serves as the interim senior pastor at Light of the World Christian Church Disciples of Christ in Indianapolis, Indiana. And under her leadership, the church has experienced healing, revitalization, and renewed strength. She is united in holy matrimony to the one she calls God's embodiment of divine love, Jeffrey Allen Murdoch, PhD. And they have three children, Jasmine, Jeffrey III, and John Patrick. Sisters, the question for us today is, what does the prophet proclaim during the aftertimes? Pandemic, politics, and paranoia. What does the prophet proclaim when in the last seven months there have been seven million confirmed cases of COVID-19 in the US, which accounts for nearly a fifth of the more than 33.1 million cases reported globally? 500,000 of those infected in our nation have been children. More than 207, 207,000 Americans have died, and on average, the virus is killing more than 700 people a day, making us the world leader in both confirmed cases and deaths. Experts warn that this number could more than double by the end of the year if we don't control this virus. What does the prophet proclaim when a disproportionate number of those being infected are black, brown, and indigenous people? When one in 1,000 black Americans have died in this COVID-19 pandemic, and if the president doesn't do something quickly by the end of the year, one in 500 would have been killed. We know that we are here because this administration has downplayed, ignored, and ridiculed science and scientists who have tried to help us understand the seriousness of this disease and the way that we can control it and break its deadly grip on America. 
But what does the prophet proclaim when the president in a cavalier fashion after contracting the virus himself rips off his mask in defiance and continually puts others at risk of catching the disease? What do we proclaim when so many more people have been affected by it financially and every corner of our nation has been hurt? The coronavirus, as you are aware, has left millions of families without stable employment. The unemployment rate is above 8% and more than 13 million Americans jobless. So that now, more than 54 million or one in six million people, including 18 million children, may experience food insecurity this year. Sisters, what does the prophet proclaim when yet another pandemic has stolen black lives from their mothers and fathers and families for 400 plus years, like that of Emmett Till and Trayvon Martin and Mike Brown and Freddie Gray and Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor, Richard Brooks and too many others to mm -hmm. name the long-standing crisis of police violence and structural racism in America, in America hit a new flashpoint with a police officer's knee in the neck death of George Floyd, which has resulted in nationwide Black Lives Matters protests for months, calling for justice and equality for all. And yet, we are still waiting on justice for Breonna Taylor. Say her name. Yes. Since a grand jury in Louisville, Kentucky, charged only one officer with wanton endangerment for shooting into Breonna Taylor's and her neighbor's adjoining wall. America is more divided than it's ever been. People are li literally living on the edge. There is the potential for having a Supreme Court that could literally wipe out the Affordable Health Care Act or Obamacare in the midst of a pandemic. And so Dr. Hale asks the question, what do we preach? What do we proclaim? That question is posed to each of us today who have the opportunity to proclaim a word of freedom, to proclaim a word of liberation, to uh, proclaim a word of liberty, not that is rooted in a privilege uh, that only benefits a select few, not the kind of liberty that only uh, benefits those who uh, make a certain amount of money, not the kind of liberty that is reserved uh, for individuals of a certain skin tone or a certain political party, but a freedom uh, that is proclaimed to captives, a freedom that is proclaimed to the oppressed, a freedom that is proclaimed to those who have been forgotten, abandoned, rejected, and even despised. What do we preach in times like these? We preach liberation, we preach hope, and we preach justice. Dean Evan? Well, that's very good. And I want to uh, apologize for uh, uh, doctors Hale and Stewart, I have a feeling that uh, some of the folks uh, in other spaces didn't want to hear what we were going to say, but it's not going to stop us. I think we've been bugged. Of course, I'm just simply going to uh, fill in until we can get her back up. And But I'll ask you this question. There have been, uh, there's been an uptick. Um, we're used to uh, police brutality, uh, unfortunately, a condition that many Black men, uh, from the time we're children and I heard your children I'm sure you had to have the same stories you know right and um, I've had it with my children but now we see that the oppressor uh, is bold enough now to begin to publicly um, uh, frankly execute black women um, and for me that is a different feeling altogether uh, I don't really know how to explain it on the one hand as a man I'm conditioned that, you know what, if 
I stand for truth, maybe I'm going to be knocked out at any point. But when you start uh, messing with our wives, our mothers, our daughters, our sisters, right, our nieces, that's that's a different emotion. And so in these, and I'm kind of just saying that's pandemic, right? That's a part of the pandemic. What is uh, what what does the black woman who mounts the pulpit? How does that inform you when you're either being prophetic or priestly? And I want to make a, a distinction. I'm talking about from a womanist perspective. Mm -hmm. um, how do we hear you um, uh, in taking that on? Would you could could you help us that, uh, Reverend Murdoch? Well, I'll say that my physical presence in the pulpit is in and of itself prophetic. It is a um, it is a response, a resisting response um, to those powers who uh, constrain the uh, the pulpit as a, a place where women don't belong. And so uh, in addition to just showing up, uh, it is also uh, the responsibility uh, to speak against powers that attempt to strangle all of our flourishing. You know, the womanist perspective is that we uh, we affirm the flourishing of all humanity. Uh, we affirm the flourishing of men and women, of boys and girls, and even those who do not fall inside of the binary systems of gender and uh, the ways that we have historically and traditionally described people. Uh, but I think that in these moments, uh, it is all the more important for us to uh, call Brianna's name. It is all the more important for us to, to call out Sandra's name. It is all the more important for us to call out the names of women uh, whose, whose stories are sometimes forgotten because they are overshadowed uh, by the profound tragedy uh, that comes uh, to Black men. But it is imperative for us to keep uh, the names of all of our men, women, boys, and girls, uh, and all of those, again, who don't even fall on those binary uh, spectrum, to keep their names lifted, but to also preach a message of justice, liberation, and to preach the gospel that Jesus preached, the gospel, the kind of gospel uh, that says the one who oppresses, the one who murders, the one who strangles, uh, the one who commits atrocities against even the least one mm -hmm. shall suffer the repercussions of a divine God. And it is the divine God who cares about the oppressed, the forgotten, uh, and the left behind. The joy in this season is that there are so many others who are rising up uh, to preach a message of liberation. Uh, many other uh, men and women who are, who are standing in their places of opportunity. Uh, to speak a liberating gospel, and uh, and we don't. The good news is that it's more than one or two of us. There's a there are generations of yeah. individuals rising up to preach this liberating word. Now, Dr. Stewart is back up, and Dr. Stewart, I'm going to let you uh, uh, take over here. Um, one of the things I'm going to risk on air is I'm going to reconvene this panel. Um, and we're going to tape a full 30 minutes and we're going to air it. I'm not going to let the devil stop. What I obviously see uh, is, look, if, if the devil's got to come in and mess with somebody's line, it's because there's a liberation, <laughs> deliberation moment. And um, Dr. Stewart, I was just simply asking Reverend Murdoch, just trying to fill in. I was talking about, you know, this uptick. We see, uh, unfortunately, many of us who are black men um, when we walk out into the streets, uh, every day can be the last day. We can run into the wrong police person and we're gone. We understand that as men. But when we see the new uh, focus on our women, um, that's a chilling effect. And we were asking the question, how you as a pulpiteer, how do you address those issues from a black woman's perspective that's going to inform us who need to hear a Rima word from the Lord. 
Thank you, Dean Evans. And um, I'm, I'm grateful for my sister and fellow cohort member, Reverend Janae Picks, Pitts, who held things together while we were trying to get reconnected. Um, I, I, I think that one of the first things we have to do is address how deeply embedded sexism, patriarchy, and misogyny is not only in society, but also in our churches. And I'm convinced that one of the issues that one of the things that has to take place first is we have to consider how deeply embedded sexism is and how far back it goes to the patristic fathers and what those implications have meant, not only for uh, persons in society, but, but, but for those of us who uh, stand behind pulpits. I heard Reverend uh, Janae say that our very presence as women in the pulpit is a, makes a statement of resistance. But I also think that as we have the opportunity to stand behind these pulpits, uh, as Reverend Renita Weems said, if we don't push the margins as women, if we don't uh, raise those issues uh, that are glaring, uh, the Breonna Taylors in our proclamation, who else is going to do it? And I think that the stewardship of our our stewardship of those moments is very important. And so I would say that silence certainly is not an option. And for those of us who've been given the opportunity to stand behind sacred desk on Sunday mornings or wherever those, those uh, situations or places may be, have a responsibility um, to bring to bear uh, those issues that impact not only women, but all of those who are oppressed, because we know that that is a part of what womanist voices or womanist theology is about. It's about liberating all who are oppressed. And so I think that as um, you know, you already heard it said that, what are we preaching in this pandemic? Some of it we should have already been preaching. We should have already been preaching freedom and liberation because people were in a pandemic before this pandemic. Poverty. <laughs> I mean, right. you know, this pandemic has just exacerbated and brought and unveiled to some extent and unmasked much of what we already knew, the disparities, uh, the poverty, uh, the oppression, uh, the issues with women being murdered in their in their beds and their names not being uh, being named, uh, the silencing and the erasure uh, of women from our narratives, whether they are narratives in terms of our preaching or narratives in media or narratives in society. Breonna Taylor had been dead for almost two months before anybody even said her name. And so right. I think that one of our responsibilities is to break the silence in the pulpit and break the silence around those issues that deeply impact not just women, uh, certainly for women, uh, because for us to be in these body suits and not address these issues that directly impact us would certainly be uh, betrayal. But to address and raise our voices concerning all those issues that affect those that are on the margins and those that are oppressed. And you know, the sad reality that I wanted to share in terms of Breonna Taylor, um, even in the indictment, her name was not called. Never mentioned. Never mentioned. Mm -hmm. Never mentioned. Never, never mentioned. Called. Never called. Like she was invisible or she didn't like exist. She, like like her incident. death never happened. That's right. And the other thing that I want to um, make sure that we address is the fact that when we look at food insecurity or hunger in America, Black women and their children. When we talk about poverty, mm -hmm. Black women or women, period, and their children are the most adversely affected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in the presidential debate, I don't know if you all noticed this, but poverty, the issue of poverty was not even brought up. There, mm -hmm. was no quest there were no questions. <laughs> there wasn't anybody even inserting that. And when we read the papers, hear the news reports, very little is being said about poverty. It's what's happening to the middle class. And we do care about the middle class. Right. But we mm -hmm. also need to care about the poor. Yeah. The least of these. Yeah. 
You know, Dr. Hale, if you if you look at any statistics and data as it relates to disparities, whether yeah. it's gender inequality, whether it's housing, whether it's economics, whether it's maternal mortality, whether it's poverty, there are glaring disparities as it relates to glaring glaring disparities as it relates to people of color and women, um, minorities, etc. And when we when we become aware of those kinds of disparities, again, I think we have a responsibility to proclaim that when we stand behind, you know, we have to integrate that information. But certainly when we look at it, um, Dr. Kenyatta Gilbert talks about this in his book, Exodus Preaching, about mm -hmm. how prophetic preaching deals with naming realities and right. naming those realities in our moments of proclamation, but also naming those realities in light of divine intentionality mm. and considering how these realities undermine uh, God's intention for human flourishing. Mm -hmm. now, and so I think that when we, when we have an opportunity to preach, this is the Gardner Taylor lecture series. One of the first statements in his book, How Shall They Preach is, Preaching right. is a matter of life and death. It is indeed. <laughs> yeah. It's a matter of and life and death. More, more Dr. Of Hill, I don't want to inter excuse me. I don't want to yeah. interrupt you, but guess what? What? We've been extended to twelve o'clock. We made it work, so we're gonna get our full time. Preach. So you all just have your way. Um, <laughs> we we're not cutting you off. And now I'm cutting out. Goodbye, preacher. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Thank Doc. You. Thank you so much. I was just going to say that um, recently I've been hearing that racism is a religion. Mm. <laughs> I was on a panel the other day with Jim Wallace and he made that statement, racism as a religious, particularly talking about white evangelicals who will not confront this president, this administration, what is going on in the streets, even having a bit of disdain over the use of the term Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. but I would have to ask the question along with that, what does it mean when God said that he was creating us in his image and likeness? Does that just mean white people? <laughs> Does it not include black people, brown people, indigenous people, Asians, the whole gamut? But let's talk about Black Lives Matter, male and female. So when racism becomes a religion and people worship that more than they worship the one true and living God, giving all people dignity, value, and worth. That is what I believe is at play in America right now. Mm -hmm. When abortion is your main issue, but you don't care about the development, the nurture, the care of that individual, particularly if they're black, mm -hmm. or brown, for the rest of their lives, when you want to have a Supreme Court that would knock out women's rights, mm -mm. take away the affordable health care, what is that? That's racism, sexism, just the whole gamut. And so, it is an intoxication with power and control. It is an obsession uh, to, to dominate. It is a perversion of the power that Jesus Christ brought into the earth. It is a, it is a grab. Um, it, is, it is a human grab yes, for power over people. Um, and it is, a, it is a perversion and a distortion of, um, of Christianity. It, yes. is, um, it is a maligning of, um, of the gospel message. And um, it, is, it is found most profoundly in those who don't want to give up power, who don't want to give up privilege. 
And, you know, I told the church on Sunday, being able, the, the fact that you cannot say Black Lives Matter is not a political problem. That's a Jesus problem. Yeah. Because when we don't have um, a, a, a full picture of who Jesus was, then you cannot fathom um, how equal and uh, beautiful and worthy and honorable other people are. Right. And uh, it, is, it is an intoxication with, with power and domination. Uh, and, and I cannot wait uh, until God has the final say <laughs> over people uh, who mistreat God's beloved. <laughs> Because God is not mocked. Mm -mm. Whenever a man or woman reaps a soul, that he or she will also reap. You put your finger on it and, when you talk about power and domination. I, and Jenkins. I would add, I, I would add too that it's a sin against creation. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the first lessons that I learned when I went to seminary, you know, they talked about all of two things. One is that all of life is sacred. And the other that they really kind of hammered home was this notion of being created in the Imago Dei, uh, being created in the image of God. And, you know, I've heard Dr. Jeremiah Wright say that the way we treat people depends upon the kind of God we worship. So if you worship a God who believes it's okay to leave babies at the border and deny them the treat their needs as holy as Dr. Aubrey Hendricks would say, and give them the things that they need to survive, the things that they need to flourish. If you think that God is white and male, if you think that God is Republican or Democrat, a lot of the way that we think about God have a lot to do with the way we treat other people, that our theology tends to inform our sociology and even our politics. And, you know, I've often wondered how people can sit in a worship space week after week, be racist, hear a message and still believe that black lives don't matter. And that is evidenced by the way that they treat us. It's evidenced in policies and everything else that we see, all of these other things that we're seeing in America. And so I, I would say, too, that in addition to what uh, Reverend Janae has said, that when you talk about racism as a religion it is to deny the the inherent worth and value of our humanity mm -hmm. and to it is a sin if you will against god's creation because all it of is us a sin. Have, been, have been created in the image of god and we know that that is i mean this embrace of this kind of religion whether it's uh, racism or white supremacy or white nationalism it boils down to idolatry it is idolatrous it is and it makes <laughs> you wonder since you brought this up what is being preached in some pulpits across america well that's the real is there not one gospel? <laughs> <laughs> well i will say that there is a risk you know to preach a daring alternative mm -hmm. oh, that's prophetic mm -hmm. preaching though it, yes. yeah <laughs> go ahead <laughs> and and it's and, and i would also say it's not just white folk that we need to raise the question I, I about agree. what are they preaching but we need to raise the question for black folk as well because there is a price to preaching a prophetic word or mm -hmm. a word that challenges a narrative about a God who is disinterested, who's apathetic, who hates blacks, who hates gays, who hates women, who hates the poor. There is a risk involved when you dare to preach that kind of gospel. But it is what I believe we are compelled to preach if we're going to proclaim a gospel that is consistent with the God who is on the side of the oppressed. Mm -hmm. That's right. And the God who is on the side of the oppressed does not leave out everybody else because I've heard people say, well, does God care about the rest of us? Can you be rich and have God love you? Of course. But you do understand that your riches and your power <laughs> position you to be used mightily by God on behalf of those who have not. And right. so that's 
the threat right there. I have to give up something. I have to sacrifice. I believe that people are afraid of this whole notion of having to sacrifice some things for the good of others. America does not have a wealth problem. America has a sharing distribution problem. Rest of the world, if we all shared and we're willing to give up some things, but we've got a greed. Yeah, that's right. Greed. Call it what it is. See, we America have, has a greed problem. How much is enough? I want to know this. Why is it that women don't appear to be afraid? Why is it that we? <laughs> well, the truth is. We afraid, we just don't allow our fears to stop us. <laughs> we do it afraid. <laughs> there, are, there are days that we are afraid, oh, yes. but we don't allow our fears to paralyze us or to stop us. Right. We do it. We jump out that boat. We launch out. <laughs> Into the deep because Into you can't walk deep. on water unless you get out of the boat. And courage yes, right. is not the absence of fear. Courage is the courage is the ability to press on in spite of your fear. And so you're right. There are some Sunday mornings, like this last Sunday morning, I had a word that I knew God gave me to preach, but I was a little nervous about it. You understand, just a little bit. <laughs> but I had to preach it <laughs> because woe unto me if I don't you preach not the gospel. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Cry loud and spare not. Spare not. Hallelujah. <laughs> the because lion has roared. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, Some indeed. Of the, the words of Valerie Bridges. With the most are in our congregations. Can I say that? Yeah. Because um, as we have become wealthier, and even in a pandemic, have done well, we have to constantly be reminded that we are blessed to be a blessing and we have to be careful that we don't allow our positions and status mm -hmm. to hamstring us and not be faithful mm -hmm. to the carrying out of the gospel and not just symbolically. Mm -hmm. What I've been struggling with is throughout the pandemic, we have been doing food drives. We've been hosting testing um, of, for the coronavirus. We've been doing, you know, churches have been doing a number of things. We need a change in policies. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We need to vote. Mm -hmm. In action, non-voting among African Americans, which I believe was 65% in 2016, is how we ended up with this current president lord have mercy lord have mercy millions of african americans are not registered those that are registered are not voting voting it's one thing to feed the hungry it's another thing to enact to elect persons who will help us enact policies right that will change the landscape. We need not just Obamacare, we need universal health care mm -hmm. for all. And that means some work on our part, but it starts with this election. I believe it starts with this. I'm not, go I'm not saying that it's all gonna be cured by this time, but <laughs> Inaction is slowly sucking the life out of us. We had a, a registration, voter registration drive uh, here at our church this past weekend. Uh, and one of the comments that one of the officials said was, he said, you know, we don't have a registration problem. We have a voting problem. He mm. said, we have so many people who are on the rolls, but they don't vote. And I would suggest that one of the reasons why there's so uh, much disengagement or lack of engagement uh, in communities of color is because it is a symptom of 
oppression in America. We have been so pressed. Uh, our voice has been neglected, overlooked, and, um, and dismantled in very strategic ways uh, that has um, called many corners of our community to believe that our, vo our voices don't matter, our votes don't matter. Um, we have bought into these narratives uh, about um, the impotence of the Black vote. Um, we, for, 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 for many parts of our community, we don't understand how voting works and how yeah. the vote we cast at the ballot box translates into an uh, impact across the system. Um, we are not educated about uh, the impact of our vote uh, in, in ways that help to, to translate a competence uh, in, in some parts of our community. And so getting engaged in the political process is also a prophetic act. Yes, Those of us who are encouraging uh, people of color, Black folks in particular, uh, to get out here and to vote, that is an act of resistance. It is an act yes, of, uh, it's, an, it's a prophetic act. And it is not only an act for people who are activists in the street, it's for those of us who are activists in the pulpit because yes. there is a direct relationship between those of us who a, who affirm a black theology mm -mm, for those of us who affirm uh, God in the person of Jesus Christ. We already have a model of resistance against yes. the powers and authorities in high places that act against the interest of the people. And so when we encourage people to vote, when we encourage people to be knowledgeable about what you're voting about, just don't go in there and just check boxes uh, just because, well, uh, you know, oh, well, yeah, yeah. Because uh, the truth be told, you know, uh, all skin folk ain't kin folk, right? So, so you also have to know what people... Uh, <laughs> what people's platforms are right. yeah. uh, so that we might be not just voters but informed voters because some of us are voting to our destruction mm -hmm. exactly let me just you, share quickly some statistics if i could okay. because you just mentioned that people don't know that their votes matter in 2016 in milwaukee in wisconsin Trump won by 23,000 votes. In Milwaukee, 93,000 blacks did not vote. In Florida, he won by 113,000 votes. In Miami, 379,000 did not vote. In Georgia, he won by 211,000 votes. In Atlanta, do you hear me, y'all? 530,000 African Americans, black folks did not vote. Mm -hmm. I, I think, were you finished? Go ahead. No, yeah, I'm through. Go ahead. I, I was going to say, because you know, you write down my street. Okay, go ahead. I think the other thing that, that we often don't realize is that while we are debating about whether we need to vote or not, the, the, the current occupant is in court trying to suppress our votes. Yes, ma'am. Filing lawsuits against, to keep us from voting. I think, and filing lawsuits to dismantle healthcare. Yes. <laughs> that will leave some 20 million people without health insurance, even as he has gone to the hospital. Yes. <laughs> Defied this virus that has killed over 200,000 people. 7 million people have contracted the virus. And even as he is receiving some of the best quality care in the world, he is filing lawsuits to keep other people from getting it. I think that as we talk about voting, if people realize what's at stake, and I think that's part of our challenge is to find a way to make what's at stake accessible to people so right. that they understand how it directly impacts them. I think sometimes when we talk in broad sweeping terms, um, 
it really has no relevance. But when we start talking about how, talking about how it's going to affect us directly and having language to, to address that, we right. help people to see the kind of stake that they have in voting. Reverend Janae was talking about uh, the voters registration drive that they had at their church. Uh, we, we do hunger relief boxes every mm -hmm. week at our church. And for the last, there've been a few voter registration drives on Wednesdays when the people come to pick up their boxes and the apathy, the, the notion that my vote does not matter. Um, the indifference that some people have concerning voting. And I'm saying, you know, do you understand why we're having to give out hunger relief boxes? Right. One of the reasons, if, if, you know, this, this is, we want to do, we want to do justice, right? <laughs> but until right. we can do justice and change policies, we have to do charity. You want a job, right? You, right. You, you understand that this pandemic has resulted in you losing your job. And so it takes that additional kind of conversation, I think. Um, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't say to people that they just need to vote. But I think helping people to understand, too, what's at stake when they don't vote. I heard Reverend Michael McBride right. say, and You're I've right. never forgotten it. He says, to, to a failure to vote is de facto voter suppression. A mm. failure to vote is de facto voter suppression. Because even when uh -huh. we don't vote, we still vote. And the people that's, who that's are right. most impacted by our failure to vote look like us. They look like us. Because we know that special interest has hijacked policy, uh, hijacked government and right, policy right. to some extent. And so I we don't we can't we can't sit this one out. You know, we really can't. We we cannot afford to sit this one out. There will be some people who could possibly survive another term of the current occupant. But I don't even want to. I don't even want to, us to have that option. My prayer is that it will be unmistakably, abundantly clear on November third. Doctor Hell, you remember where we were <laughs> the last election? <laughs> don't remind yeah. me of that, please. <laughs> we, I want it to be abundantly clear that the winner is for for this term will be different. It's got, it's to, be got to be different. If we, if are, we going are going to survive. to survive. Yeah. Because presidential power, presidential power impacts the nation's values, the nation's direction. It impacts yes, Supreme you. Court justices selections. It impacts the selection of federal lifetime judges. If you just look at the number of judges, federal judges that have been appointed in mm -hmm. under this administration, of course, we don't know about them until we have to go to court because that doesn't show up in the news. You have to read about it. But the presidential power affects it. it affects our image worldwide. It affects policies that are issued via executive order. It affects war powers, you know, and then let's not just talk about the president to raise. Let's talk about the Senate, too, exactly. because we know that the Senate determines what comes to the floor. Right. Even as people are losing their jobs and, and, and uh, they've been trying to work on a bill, the Senate majority leader refuses mm -hmm. to bring that to the floor, but they are pushing through this Supreme Court nominee, even though the chief, the current occupant is suffering with a virus. Yeah. And so knowing what these, how these elections impact us, how these elections impact education quality and police relations and uh, gun laws and health care and affordable housing and college affordability and the census and criminal justice reform. All of that right. is, a, is impacted by who we put in office. And so mm -hmm. we, we need to at least put people, vote for people who will take the concerns that we have seriously. We and have make, to vote and, and work down. toward fundamental change. Exactly. Which is a good segue into the fact that we are talking about what shall we proclaim? <laughs> Preachers, do you hear us? <laughs> Touch your neighbor and go vote. Yeah. Touch your neighbor and go to the poll. Touch your neighbor and I'm going to drive you to the poll. <laughs> but not only that, when we talk about preaching, 
what you all have just talked about, what we've just talked about, can be preached from the pulpit. That's right. And from the Bible. And That's you it. don't and have from the Bible. The Bible to preach justice and liberation. It is in the yeah. Bible. That's and right. I preached a couple of Sundays ago voting as an act of loving your neighbor as you love yourself. If you love your neighbor and listed all the things, like you said, the practical things that voting will achieve for us. Because we have to vote up and down the ticket, not just, you know, <clears throat> we love to vote for the president, president, but we have to vote also for the attorney general. When right. we think about why Breonna Taylor didn't get a different indi or indictment from her death, didn't get an indictment in Kentucky, who presented that information to the grand jury? The mm -hmm. attorney general of the state. That's right. That's right. So we have to understand. Preachers, you can talk about what each of these offices can achieve and do achieve yeah. in our different areas. Yeah. So we got work to and, do. You know, and you know, Janae just said, Reverend Janae just said, it's in the Bible. You know, we're yeah. not people want to make justice political, but justice is not political, it's biblical. And yeah. when we talk about justice, we're we're really lifting up how so much of what we see in the world is out of alignment with God's intentions for shalom, for well-being. And we have a responsibility, I think, to lift that up in our proclamation. You're right. <laughs> Dr. Frank Thomas always tells us, I'm tired of uh, waiting on my breakthrough, <laughs> waiting on my miracle. <laughs> He tells us that every time we meet, <laughs> he said, he said, he said I'm tired of getting my breakthrough. And you know, there is a place for that because yeah. people are living with real existential challenges. But I think even as we are encouraging people and exhorting people uh, in an effort to keep the, help them to hold on to hope, we also have to have a word uh, about justice. Given and Paul the, tells the, us that we is, are yeah. also to work out our salvation, our deliverance. <laughs> I'm broadening it, our justice, our equality. We're fear and trembling. We have a role to play in this. Yes. You know, yes. God has done the work, but we need to follow <laughs> through. And so voting is an act. Voting is a nonviolent act or the greatest nonviolent act, this is what um, John Lewis John said, Lewis. Yeah. that we have, yeah. and we have to exercise it. So if we're in fear or we're in feeling intimidated, then we've got to resist that and move in spite of that because mm -hmm. an action will kill us. Right. It is killing us. That's right. Yeah, we're... We, <laughs> Well, sisters, we have about five minutes left, I believe, four minutes. And so I wanted to see if you had one last parting word that you wanted to give as we wrap up this wonderful time that we've had. Well, I just want to say thank you for including me in this conversation. It is just, it's good to be with both of you, giants in the faith uh, and giants <laughs> in the faith. I'm Somebody. just... You somebody, Reverend. Yeah, honest to be here today. But in all seriousness, um, you know, so one, I'm honored to be here today. Two, I think it is we have to encourage each other. Those of us uh, who preach a a um, who preach liberation and who preach justice, we have to encourage each other along the way because uh, the road gets very, very difficult. Um, and uh, we need solidarity even amongst ourselves to encourage each other. You're on the right path, keep pushing, keep stretching. And so for all of those who are That's watching right. today, I want to say to you, you're not alone. You, there, there, are, there are so many other uh, voices, instruments for God's glory that are also preaching a liberating uh, gospel for, for the masses. And it's important for you to know that God is never neutral, that God always takes sides. And God takes the side 
of the oppressed. And when we, um, when we advance a message of hope, justice, liberation for those who are on the underside of life, we are yeah. on God's side. It's not that God is on our side. We're on God's side. Yeah. And so it is an honor uh, to be amongst so many of you who are preaching and proclaiming a word for this season. Thank you. Dr. Uh, Gina? Yes. Uh, let me again echo uh, Reverend Janae and say that I appreciate the invitation. Um, of course, you know, we already had friendship and relationships, so I, I knew there would be great energy and chemistry uh, on this call. So it's just been great uh, to just have this time for conversation. I, I will be honest um, and say in closing that there, there really are some days that I'm just speechless as a preacher and a pastor. Um, I'm a news junkie and, you know, I sometimes I take breaks from the news, but uh, I'm a I'm a student of scripture and culture, and so it often informs my preaching. But the downside of that is that sometimes the things I see on the news are just depressing, and sometimes I really am I really am speechless about you know what do I say? Sometimes I just don't really feel like I have a word <laughs> on Sundays. Right. Um, but in all honesty, but one thing I do know for sure is that even though I may not always have a word, there is always the word. That's right. And the word always has the word. In the word, there is always a word from the Lord. And I know that our people show up much like Zedekiah showed up, uh, raising the question, half fearful, half doubting, half anxious, half afraid wanting to know, is there a word from the Lord? Um, and the good news is, is that there's always a word from the other side. And that good news is, is that the last thing, the last will, the last woe, the last hashtag, the last disappointment, the last election, <laughs> the last or the last or the worst thing that happened to us never is the last thing that could happen. Because God Thank you. Will always have the last word. Hope is going to have the last word. Justice is going to have the last word. The arc, the moral arc of the universe is long. I was thinking about that this morning, but it bends toward justice. And that's my story, and I'm sticking with it. I'm going down with the God <laughs> who's on the side of the oppressed. Well, I want to thank Dr. Evans for this opportunity, and um, Reverend Janae and Reverend Gina, thank you. This was an amazing conversation. I am encouraged. I, like you, uh, struggle at times, Dr. Gina, with what to say, but there is always a word. And my word is hope. Mm -hmm. God is sovereignly in control of his world right. and his people. And so I am trusting that God will speak this November the 3rd or beyond. <laughs> That's right. And beyond. That's right. Speak in such a way that we are clear that it's him and that we um, have what we need to move forward. I am also encouraged because there are so many awesome and wonderful women and men on this call. I can see your chats. Thank you so much for your affirmation of us and your support. Now, let's go and change the world. And to help us move forward, the Reverend Jeremiah C. Hackley student at Morehouse and general secretary of the MSR student board will now bless us in song. God bless you, my sweet sisters and brothers. I love you. The Morehouse, the Morehouse. School of Religion is not only committed to the work of God, but we are most certainly committed to the worth of God. And we know that God in liberation theology, black liberation theology is committed to the worth of us. And so this is praise as a two-way street medley. Oh Lord, we give you praise. And Say thank you for 
This is the day the Lord has made. The Bible tells us to rejoice and be glad in it. To the president of ITC, President Reverend Matthew Williams, to the Morehouse School of Religion chair of our board, Dr. Clarence Moore, to our Dean, Dean Dr. Joseph Evans, I want to say thank you for this privilege and opportunity to be a part of such an esteemed series, the Gardner C. Taylor Lecture. I want to say to those who are connecting with us through virtual, Facebook Live, we thank you for your prayers and we thank you for your participation. I am so humbled to have this opportunity. Dr. Gordon C. Taylor, I would hear him say that he would be very grateful to those who even just thought of his name to place his name in the ring. And so I too am thankful that there were those who just thought of my name to place it in the ring. I want to ask if you will join with me in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 32, and I want to commence reading at verse number one, Jeremiah chapter 32, beginning reading at verse number one. Let us hear what the prophet Jeremiah records in the book of Jeremiah. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the 10th year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, which was the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar. For then the king of Babylon's army besieged Jerusalem. And Jeremiah the prophet was shut up in the court of the prison, which was in the king of Judah's house. For Zedekiah, king of Judah, had shut him up, saying, Wherefore doest thou prophesy? And say, thus saith the Lord, behold, I will give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall take it. And Zedekiah, king of Judah, shall not escape out of the hand of the Chaldeans, but shall surely be delivered into the hands of the king of Babylon, and shall speak with him mouth to mouth, and his eyes shall behold his eyes. And he shall lead Zedekiah to Babylon, and there shall he be until I visit him, saith the Lord. 
though ye fight with the Chaldeans, you shall not prosper. And Jeremiah said, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, behold, Hanamel, the son of Shalom, thine uncle shall come unto thee, saying, buy thee my field that is in Anathoth, for the right of redemption is thine to buy it. So Hanamel, my uncle's son, came to me in the court of the prison, according to the word of the Lord, and said unto me, by my field, I pray thee, that is in Anathoth, which is in the country of Benjamin, for the right of inheritance is thine, and the redemption is thine. Buy it for thyself. Then I knew that that is this was the word of the Lord. And I bought the field of Hanamiel, my uncle's son, that was in Anathoth, and weighed him the money, even 17 shekels of silver. Amen. The sermon text verses will come from Jeremiah chapter 32, verses 6 through 9. The sermon title, I would like to tag this text, There is Hope. There is Hope. My brothers and sisters, the prophet Jeremiah was born in the 17th century BC and lived during a period of crisis for the kingdom of Judah. His ministry spanned for the time before and after the fall of Jerusalem to the Babylonians. He was called to prophecy at a young age and supported the reform of the pious king Josiah of Judah who reigned from 640 to 609 BC. However, idolatry returned to Judah following his reign. Jeremiah recognized the impending disaster was attributed to the people's disobedience to God. His pleas for a return to the way of the Lord fell on deaf ears during the subsequent reigns of the kings of Judah. Judah and Jerusalem fell during the reign of King Zedekiah. Samaria in the northern kingdom of Israel fell to Syria. Syria fell to the Assyrians. Assyria fell to Babylon who battled with Egypt for control over the land of Judah. And as we know, Babylon through Nebuchadnezzar won, but it was a mess. Not least of which is because Babylon would ultimately fall to Persia. The temple of Solomon was destroyed in 586 BC. And thousands of citizens were deported during the Babylonian exile. Jeremiah himself suffered persecution with imprisonment, disgrace, and eventual exile to Egypt. Jeremiah had warned the people about all these disasters and appealed to people to turn back to God. He said they had turned their back on their God as no other nation had turned its back on their gods. Who weren't even real gods at all. Jeremiah could have led a, led a quiet, civilized life in the court of Nebuchadnezzar. Instead, he remained in Judah with the Jews. This prophet 
was very unpopular, which is why we get the impression, I imagine, that Jeremiah is a depressing character and book. But if we think this, we miss part of the point of what Jeremiah is about. There's a real thread of hope which runs through this book. Jeremiah preached, advocated submission to Babylon, which is why he was really unpopular. To Jeremiah, Nebuchadnezzar was God's servant, God's instrument, his agent of his purpose and judgment. And my brothers and sisters, to rebel against his agent, Nebuchadnezzar, was to rebel against God himself. But the thread of hope, which is picked up in today's text, is that after judgment, after the exile, after all the, the, the jockeying for geographical power and playing politics, after the pestilence says, after the paranoia, God would restore prosperity. Jeremiah reprimanded the false prophets and the political leaders identified as the shepherds in the book of Jeremiah of his time who had been set over Judah. They would be punished for the way they had led and scattered the people of Judah. But God will gather his remnant from where they had been driven and put a new shepherd over them. Oh, my brothers and sisters, the wonderful words of hope which are found in Jeremiah chapters 30 through 33 were spoken while Jeremiah in Jeremiah specifically 32, chapter 32, verse 2, was shut up in the court of the prison in the king of Judah's house. Jeremiah was accused of committing treason. No less because he spoke of the imminent defeat and final demise and captivity of the, the present regime. In Jeremiah chapter 32 verses 6 through 8, which you've heard in your reading, you've heard in your listening, God spoke a very personal word to Jeremiah Concerning a cousin who was about to visit him in prison. Not for his comfort, but with a view to selling him some land in Anathoth. This must have seemed quite strange to the prophet Jeremiah. Considering his own incarceration on the one hand. And the imminent prospect of Exile for the whole nation on the other. And yet. And yet he, he knew it was the voice of God. When sure enough his cousin came offering him the right of redemption for some land he owned. And in Jeremiah chapter 32 verses 9 through 14 we find although the business was private in prison. Yet. It involved a transaction, a purchase of property, which necessarily took on a very public nature. Uh, the, the purchase of property in prison was sealed with all due order, even in prison, with witnesses and the appropriate evidence of purchase deposited with Jeremiah's faithful secretary, Baruch. And in Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 12, on their part, I imagine the witnesses may have thought it odd, strange, that this prophet in prison who had predicted exile was still con content to purchase property in a doomed 
territory. Territory seized by the Babylonians. However, don't miss this. The private proposition gave rise to the public purchase transaction and the public purchase transaction gave rise to the prophetic proclamation of a prospective restoration. Can I just back up, rewind and press forward one more time? The private Proposition gave rise to the public purchase transaction and the public pur pur purchase transaction gave rise to the prophetic proclamation of a prospective restoration. Hope. After the pestilences, after the pandemic, after the, 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 the geographical uh, playing politics and paranoia. Emboldened by his recent purchase of property in prison, we also find in Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 16, Jeremiah resorted to private prayer for the public well being on the off chance that the Lord might yet stay the hand of judgment, which was against his people. And oh, my brothers and sisters. This is a model prayer that the prophet prays while in prison, acknowledging first God's omnipotence. He is the creator of all things, all powerful and able to do all things. There's nothing too hard for thee, Jeremiah confessed as he prayed. In Jeremiah chapter 32 verse 17, Jeremiah continues to acknowledge God is our faithful covenant God. Who demonstrates his loving kindness to thousands of those who love him. In Jeremiah chapter 32 verse 18, he is the just God. In Jeremiah 32 verse 19, and shall not. The judge of the earth do right. Jeremiah continues in his praying in prison. Acknowledge he is also the God of redemption who brought the children of Israel out of Egypt and planted them in the good land. In Jeremiah chapter 32 verse 22 through 23. So can I just pause for a minute as I found Jeremiah on his knees praying in prison, testifying. Can I just testify with Jeremiah by testifying? He is the first person of the Trinity, God the Father. The second person of the Trinity, God the Son. Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus the Christ. The third person of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit. The second person of the Trinity, Jesus, who washed us and saved us from the penalty and the power of sin. He renewed our heart by his Holy Spirit and set a new song in our mouth. What is that song? And I just know somebody out there can sing it with me and can say it with me. I am redeemed. Bought with a price. Jesus has changed my whole life. If anybody asks you just who I am, tell them. Tell them. I am. I am redeemed. Jeremiah brings his people's present reality into his prayer. Even while in prison, it is as it appears, they rebelled Judah, Jerusalem, and are receiving what they deserved. And yet, 
he is perplexed as to what the future holds for having declared that the exile is inevitable and yet we find again in Jeremiah chapter 32 verse 25 the Lord has instructed him to buy this field and I don't, I don't know about you, my brothers and sisters, but, 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 but maybe you may raise the question around about now, why? The explanation of God's instruction to Jeremiah to buy the land in such a time was that it was, don't miss this, a pledge, a guarantee. A 17 shackle down payment, if you will, on God's promise that they would eventually return to the land as he referenced in Jeremiah chapter 32, verses 43 through 40, 43 through 44. The private proposition gave rise to the public purchase transaction and the public purchase transaction gave rise to the prophetic proclamation of a prospective restoration after the pestilences, after the politics, after the paranoia, the exile. There is hope. You know, my brothers and sisters, when the New Testament was written, the word Exodus had become a euphemism for death. It is used as such in Second Peter. Chapter number one, verse 15. Likewise, Jesus discussed his own exodus with Moses and Elijah in the Mount of Transfiguration. And this he accomplished in the cross of Calvary. Purchasing our salvation. And sealing the promise with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the pledge, a down payment, if you will. A deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until we enter the fullness of our redemption so that even when things my brothers and sisters look desperate looks discouraging despairing and defeated in the midst of this pandemic in 2020 in the midst of the dysfunctional politics in 2020 we know that as Christians we have our hope in Jesus the Christ our hope in is in the one who came down through 42 generations conceived in the womb of a virgin called Mary by the Holy Spirit. Our hope walked the dusty streets of Palestine giving sight to the blind. Our hope made men, women, boys and girls. Women walk. Is there anybody in the house? Our hope walked around and saw a woman with 
with 12 years of issue of blood and said to that woman your faith has made you whole and that woman went away not only hopeful but the Bible says that she was healed is there anybody in the house thou hope whose best friend was in Bethany and he found his way making it to Bethany four days later and called Lazarus a name because he said to Mary and Martha do you believe that I am the resurrection is there anybody in the house our hope made its way to a hill called Calvary and a hope laid his hands down on an old rugged cross and gave his hands to the nails and gave his feet to the nails our hope he said to them if I be lifted up I'll draw my death will draw men women boys and girls black men white men red women black women white women Jews and Gentiles Protestants and Catholics if I be lifted up I'll draw all men unto me they lifted him high they lifted hope wide stretched him wide hope hung there between the sixth to the ninth hour dying for your sins dying for my sins come on somebody taking on the wrath of God taking on the penalty of God taking on the anger of God he took your place he was the ultimate propitiation the substitutionary lamb on that cross dying for you and dying for me making it possible for us to be reconciled making it possible for us to be restored back onto the heavenly father is there anybody in the house knows what I'm talking about he died on that Friday between the sixth to the ninth hour making a way back unto God through the precious blood and sacrifice of Jesus Christ our hope died is there anybody here that knows what I'm talking about he stretched wide he's now lifting his head up and he's praying a prayer father forgive them for they know not what they do the Bible says our hope says Tadalestai I paid it in full I completed the mission that my father sent me on I paid the penalty for sin broken the dominion of sin and one of these old days I'm gonna come back and deliver you those who believe in the ultimate sacrificial lamb deliver you from the presence of sin but unto then he cried out into thy hands I commend my spirit and I'm so glad that Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus went to Pilate requested the hope dead body put it in a borrowed tomb and hope stayed there old Friday evening old Friday night hope stayed there old Saturday and Saturday night hope is there anybody in the house before hope come on somebody before hope got up he pulled the sting from death pulled the victory from the grave rolled it up in his divine hand placed it in the vault of eternity and oh 
family. A hope got up from the grave. He was raised from the dead with all power, resurrection power, restoration power, reconciliation power, loving power, all power in his hands. And I'm so glad that a hope was raised from the dead because it proved that God's promise is absolutely true. You can trust his promise. Is there anybody here? You can trust his power because his power is absolutely real. A hope walked around for 40 days showing himself to his disciples, showing himself to 500 or more. A hope walked around and on the outside of Jerusalem, a hope caught a cloud, went back to heaven where he's sitting on the right hand throne of the Father. And one of these old days, a hope is going to return. Is there anybody in the house? And aren't you glad that after the, the pandemic, after the politics, after the paranoia, that we can still have a hope? Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood in his righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but a holy, a holy lean on Jesus' name, on Christ, on Christ, the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. If you know what I'm talking about, you ought to say, hey, Amen, 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 hallelujah, praise his holy name, isn't anybody out there who knows he's worthy, he's worthy, he's worthy, he's worthy, he's worthy, he's worthy to be, be praised, we thank God there is hope even in the time of Jeremiah the purchasing of the field was an indication that God has given that there was still hope even in desperate doom and despair looking time even in the exile it was a pledge and a promise that he will return a remnant of his people back unto their homeland. And those of us who believe in God through Jesus Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit, we know this world is not our home. We're just strangers passing through. And there is a home not made with hands, eternal into heaven. May God bless you. May God keep you is our prayer. There is hope even after the pandemic, even after the politics, even after the paranoia. To God be the glory for what he has done, what he is doing, and what he will do. This is what God says back to us. Neither forsake you.
that tune. I just felt it in my spirit. He wants you to say, I love you right where you're home. Say it. Hey, come on, right at home. Say it. To the president of this esteemed seminary, Reverend Matthew Williams, to the dean of the Morehouse School of Religion, Dr. Joseph Evans, to the faculty, the administration, students, alumni, and virtual participants, I greet you in the master's name of Jesus who died for us who rose for us, and who is counting on us as we minister in his name. He who requires of us that we are to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. I'm extremely grateful to Dean Evans for extending this invitation to me, especially in light of my physical limitations and my handy capabilities. My stroke four years ago left me with an acute infarct of the right thalamus, ocular neuropathy and diplopia, a tumor in my parotid gland, a stent in my pulmonary artery, which supplies oxygenated blood to the left ventricle and was 99% blocked. It left me extremely challenged on the left side of my body and most notably with the vocal cords, my left vocal cord no longer being parallel to the right vocal cord which causes me to have a severe speech 
defect that makes my voice no longer able to sing as I love to sing, and no longer to have the preaching voice with which many of you have gotten accustomed to across the years. Because the vocal cords no longer vibrate simultaneously, And because they no longer vibrate parallel with each other, there is an air gap which causes a raspy sound in my voice and makes it sound like I have a cold. I thank you for bearing with me as I attempt to lecture. And I thank Dr. Evans for inviting me in spite of my speech handicap. In addition to the ITC and Morehouse alumni and our virtual visitors, I would also like to thank publicly my colleagues in ministry who joined me this year for the 2020 Gardner C. Taylor Lecture. Having cited you or cited for you my physical handicaps, which will make this presentation sound awkward. I must make note of the coronavirus handicap, which prevents us from being together physically and in the King's Chapel. Not having the benefit and blessing of personal fellowship is one thing. Not being able to hear the panel discussion live and in living color in real time and not being able to hear this sermon also in real time puts me at a disadvantage and further handicaps my feeble attempts at addressing this year's theme. Had we all been together in one place and in the same sacred space, I could have heard the woman's reflections on the theme before my presentation and could have added my remarks having been able to build on the foundation that the pastors ministering before me had laid. Not having heard them in person, however, I publicly thanked them in advance, and I acknowledge their brilliance, their expertise, and their experience in the vineyard. I know of the pastor of Light of the World Christian Church in Indianapolis, Indiana, I do not know her personally, however, as I know Dr. Hale and Dr. Stewart. What I do know of all three of them, however, is that they are awesome and mighty women of God. And I also know that you have been blessed by the offerings they bring to this year's lecture series. I thank them for laying the foundation. And I thank our 2020 preacher from Columbus, Georgia, who has already ushered us into the throne room and opened the door for the entry of the King of Kings. Now to the task at hand. The theme for the 2020 Gardner C. Taylor Lecture series is, what does the prophet proclaim during the aftertimes? Pandemic, politics, and paranoia. The scripture chosen to introduce this theme is Jeremiah 25, 32 in the New Revised Standard Version translation. You've heard it before this morning, but just let me repeat it for purposes of framing the lecture. Jeremiah 25, 32 reads, Thus says the Lord of hosts, See, Disaster is spreading from nation to nation, and a great tempest is stirring from the farthest parts of the earth. A morning preacher has already preached, so I am not going to preach, I promise you. If I were going to preach, however, I would stop on the first phrase of the chosen verse verse 32, to talk about the voice that is giving Jeremiah this prophecy. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Pastor Reginald Sharp of the Fellowship Baptist Church 
in Chicago would point out that God identifies God's self in this verse as the commander in chief of the fighting angels because the hosts, the Lord of hosts, the hosts of the fighting angels. These are the Archangel Michael and the brothers who throw hands and who move furniture. I'm not going to preach, however, so I will leave that phrase alone. My years at the Hampton Ministers Conference, from the time I was a little boy accompanying my father each year, I was exposed to both lectures and sermons. I do know the difference. Many years in the latter decades at Hampton, as I had my pen and pencil out to take notes, however, I was disappointed as I watched the Hampton Ministers Conference devolve in far too many years into a preaching contest where the lecturers seemed not to have known that they were asked to lecture. It seemed like it became a contest and competition of who can out-preach whom. I think I shared with the Christian Theological Seminary audience in my lecture titled 70 Years of Preaching, how one year I was angry as I prepared myself to hear a lecture on homiletics. I had heard Dr. Jim Forbes' lecture on homiletics. I had heard Bishop Walter Thomas' lecture on homiletics. I had heard Dr. Gardner C. Taylor' lecture on homiletics. And I had heard Dr. Thomas Hoyt lecture on homiletics. The homiletician scheduled for that afternoon lecture was a renowned homiletician, so I was ready to add yet another layer to the foundation I was picking up each year on homiletics. The Negro did not even try to lecture. He simply took a text and proceeded to preach. I was angry for about 10 minutes. And I said to myself, self, you have two choices. You can choose to sit here and be angry that you paid your registration fee to hear a lecture and not hearing a lecture, or you can choose to sit back, relax, and enjoy this sermon. I chose the second option. I put my pen and pad back into my briefcase, took out my handkerchief, waved it at him and said, preach, brother. <laughs> it was a great sermon. It came nowhere being a lecture, but it was a great sermon. I do know the difference between lecturing and preaching. I have been asked to lecture. We've heard one sermon for the afternoon, and two of the three women scholars on this panel this morning I know to be excellent. The excellent pulpiteers, so you might have heard three to four great sermons already today. I suggest that you take out your pens, your iPads, or your iPhones, however, because this will not be a sermon. This will be a lecture. Dr. Jerome C. Ross, the professor of Hebrew Bible at the Samuel de Proctor School of Theology at Virginia Union University, Dr. Ross wrote a fascinating piece which was put in as a separate chapter in Sam Roberts' book, Born to Preach. You can download Dr. Ross's chapter in PDF form. The title of his chapter is, quote, The Cultural Affinity Between the Ancient Yahwists and African Americans, colon, 
a hermeneutic for homiletics, end quote. I like Dr. Rolfe's work, and I choose this particular analysis of his for today's lecture for two reasons. The first reason is that Ross's scholarship in many ways addresses Dr. Gardner C. Taylor's primary concern about the black church in the 21st century. At the fest shrift held right here at Morehouse, at ITC, sponsored by Morehouse, Dr. Calendar, Carolyn Knight honored Dr. Taylor's work in quite a unique way. Dr. Knight pulled together scholars, pastors, preachers, Christian educators, and church folk to honor, to address, to critique, and to respond to the mind and the eloquent oratory of Dr. Taylor's rhetoric, to give a shout out to Joe Evans' most recent work. And Dr. Knight did it in this way. For three days, we were to engage Dr. Taylor's brilliant mind using this format. With a morning and an afternoon session on Wednesday and Thursday, the sessions were assigned topics such as the black preacher as public theologian, the black preacher as pastoral counselor, or preaching as pastoral counseling, the prophetic nature of black preaching, the priestly nature of black preaching, black theology, black practical theology, womanist theology, etc. It has been over 20 years now since that first shift was held. As an aside, yo, I still cannot get the tapes from that conference. Morehouse won't get up off them. Excuse me. Back to the point at hand. The five workshops starting on Wednesday morning were structured as follows. Dr. Taylor would address the theme for that session for however long he wanted to, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes or longer. With him being the Dean of Black Preaching in the nation, and many would say, Cardinal C. Taylor was the Dean of all preaching in the nation. He literally was allowed to take his time. Three persons were asked to respond to whatever he said on that session's topic. The three first responses were instructed firmly not to bring any prepared notes on the theme of that particular session. They were asked to take notes during Dr. Taylor's reflection and to respond to him on the basis of what he had just said and not on the basis of what they had drafted at home in their study on that particular theme. They each had 10 minutes to respond to Dr. Taylor, no matter how long he had talked. Then after a 10 minute coffee break, a panel of six persons was asked to address the theme with prepared notes for, and address it for 10 minutes each with the leftover time being for general conversation, question and answers. We would then break for lunch and come back in the afternoon with the same for, format. It would be a different theme, of course. Dr. Taylor would speak to that next theme. Three respondents would react to his reflections. A short tea break in the afternoon was again followed by a six-person panel, each having 10 minutes to address the theme with prepared remarks that they had put together on their understanding of the theme and its application in parish ministry, Christian education, or whichever discipline they represented. The same process was followed on Thursday with a morning session and an afternoon session and on Friday, the same format was following, with the exception being a festive luncheon, closing out the workshop seminars honoring Dr. Gardner C. Taylor as our beloved Dean and our pastor. I, along with Dr. Otis Moss Jr. and Dr. Robert Franklin, 
were assigned to respond to Dr. Taylor's reflections on the black preacher as public intellectual. I followed Carolyn Knight's instructions. I brought no prepared notes. I brought no bibliography. I only brought my pad and pencil to take notes, as Dr. Taylor reflected. Those of you who know Dr. Taylor, or who knew Dr. Taylor, know that his talking for 20 minutes on whatever topic set the place on fire, or as my millennial daughter would say, on fire. Halfway through his presentation, however, I stopped taking notes in astonishment. My astonishment was caused by a two-pronged jab in the heart and head as he raised the question that has haunted me now for over two decades. As a follow-up to his haunting question, Dr. Taylor started to tick off the names of approximately 15 historically black congregations that had once had the word Africa or African in their charter, but whom the conferees gathered here in Atlanta that week knew by different names, names of streets on which they sat, or names of biblical places, names like 19th Street Baptist Church, Mount Zion Baptist Church, Madison Avenue Presbyterian Church, Mount Gilead Baptist Church, etc. In my hometown of Philadelphia, the African Church of St. Thomas had in its original charter, St. Thomas African Episcopal Church. It was formed as the, Af the Anglican Church for the Africans who lived in the city of Philadelphia and the Philadelphia vicinity. I flinched when Dr. Taylor used that church as an example because my uncle, my father's brother, Mr. Creed Wright, had been a lay leader at St. Thomas, a reader. I agonized in the 1960s when the bourgeois Negroes who belonged to that church took the word African out of the title, changed the title charter so the word African would not appear in the charter. That was the era, 1960s, of we black and we proud, the era of the black revolution. But the Negroes in St. Thomas were no longer African. They were no longer colored. They were now Negroes with a capital N. Fortunately, by the time Uncle Creed died, the leadership of St. Thomas had changed the name back to include and embrace their African heritage. It is now known as the African Episcopal Community of St. Thomas. I sat in that session with my head swimming as I relived the pain of black folk throwing away 200 or more years of history because of their political respectability and their desire to be embraced by their white brothers and sisters as equals had made them disown their African heritage and disown their identity. The church's original name was chosen because of Absalom Jones the African. When Absalom Jones and Richard Allen, two Africans, were dragged out of the St. George Methodist Episcopal Church, the white ME church in Philadelphia, the first thing Jones and Allen did, church-wise, was to form the Free African Society. After a few years of the Society's work, Richard Allen was granted a charter and became the pastor of Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church. They kept the Methodist Episcopal Book of Worship and Book of Order and Order of Worship and added the name African in front of the ME, from ME to AME, to show that they welcomed white Christians and were not like the white ME Christians that did not welcome black persons as equals. They adopted as the original symbol, the original motto and insignia, 
God our Father, Christ our Savior, and man our brother. In my lifetime, that motto has morphed into God our Father, Christ our Redeemer, the Holy Spirit our Comforter, humankind our family. They welcomed all of mankind back in the 19, pardon me, the 1780s. Yes, my sister. Sexism was alive and well in the 1780s. That's the use of the word man and mankind. Absalom Jones did not go with Richard Allen into the AME communion. He stayed Anglican and was ordained as the first rector of the St. Thomas African Episcopal Church, the Anglican Church for Africans in the city of Philadelphia. In the first few decades of the church's existence, as an aside, it was known as Jones Chapel. Dr. Taylor's illustration of churches that had once been first African Baptist, second African Baptist, third African Baptist was an illustration of his own in question. His question was this, will the black church turn her back on Mother Africa going into the 21st century as she did when we came into the 20th century. Before naming those churches or listing the names of those churches he knew about, including his own parish, which had become Mount Zion, but it had once had African in the title of his charter, Dr. Taylor lamented the fact that we did turn our back on Africa. Coming into the 20th century, we no longer wanted to be African. We no longer wanted to be identified as African. Thus, the Niagara movement and the NAACP colored. We no longer wanted to have any connection to our homeland. He said as an aside, no Jew would turn his or her back on Israel the way African descended persons had turned their backs on their motherland. Dr. Taylor wondered aloud, if we would repeat that same mistake and grievous error in the 21st century. Dr. Jerome Ross joins a host of other black theologians and womanist theologians who have responded to that challenge, not turned their backs on Africa, but who have embraced the African heritage proudly and embraced it exceedingly well. Dr. Ross is just one scholar who has done that and he is joined by a host of scholars, Drs. Randy Bailey, Renita Weems, Jacqueline Grant, Will Gaffney, Kane O'Felder, Gerard Wilmer, Will Moore, J.D. Otis Roberts, Dale Andrews, Charles Long, Forrest Harris, Reverend Reggie Williams, the cluster of scholars here at ITC, the cluster of scholars at Virginia Union, John Kenney, Boykin Sanders, Colleen Burchett, Julia Speller, Stephanie Crumpton, Rachel Harding, Vincent Harding, Ella and Henry Mitchell, the writers of the African American Lectionary, Valerie Bridgman, their names are legion, far too many for me to name. Not turning his back on Mother Africa, but openly embracing African history and African culture is one reason I love Dr. Ross's work. The second reason I use his work or this specific work to, ref to frame my remarks today is because of how he answers the question that Dr. Joseph Evans raises in choosing the wording for this year's theme. Let me try to unpack what I mean by that statement and then let you get on with your day. In addition to trying to tying together the culture of ancient Yahwists and the culture of African Americans, one of the many things Dr. Ross points out in his study of the cultural affinity between the two 
is the eye-opening and psyche-jolting fact that every word of Scripture from Genesis 1 to Revelation 21 was written under one of six different kinds of oppression. All of the books we love in the Bible, all of the phrases we love, all of the biblical verses we quote, all of the inspirational words that have lifted our tiresome and weary souls, all of those words in our Bible were written by people under oppression. In the classes that I teach, seminary classes, I always point out as a sidebar the unnerving fact that most of the commentaries, most of the Sunday school materials, most of the Christian education materials, and most of the lectures and bibliographies used in most of the PWIs were written by the oppressors, not written by people under oppression. You can tuck that little fact in your sidebar portfolio and melanate on it, marinate on it a little later on. Poisley and other reputable, reputable Old Testament scholars who are not persons of color agree with Dr. Ross about those six different periods of oppression and six different kinds of oppression that we need to take seriously as we read the various texts that we use for preaching and for teaching. Six types of oppression. Six different types of oppression. Oppression under slavery is not the same as oppression under exile. The six different kinds are as follows. First, there is comedic oppression. Colonized education has taught us to call Kemet Egypt. And if I were teaching a class, I would take up the rest of this class time expounding on that reality. Colonizers always have this awful tendency of changing the names of places and changing the name of the people that they colonize. The people of Kemet did not call themselves the Egyptian. The people of Kemet did not call their country Egypt. During the period of Grecian oppression, the period of Alexander the Great's colonization, the Greeks changed the name of the country to Aegyptos. They also changed the name of Cush and Nubia to Aethiop. That is not what the indigenous people called their land or called themselves. They were self-identified as Nubian or Cushite. Egyptians or Kamites were self-identified as Kamites. Another important sidebar that I've often used in my classes that Michelle Obama somehow missed as she wrote her best-selling novel is the fact that the first kind of oppression, comedic oppression, was at the hands of some black people. Egyptians or Kamites were black. I have been preaching this fact since 1972 as a pastor, that everybody of color ain't your kind. All your skin folks ain't your kin folks. And everybody not your kind is not your enemy, as the great theologian Martin Lawrence would say. Now run, tell that. Dr. Randy Bailey of this great institution where we meet virtually today, a brilliant Hebrew Bible scholar, my classmate and my friend, came to our church about 45 years ago now. Dr. Bailey was on the agenda to lecture before the Society for the Study of Biblical Literature. And he called me about a month or so before their October meeting to ask me if he could present his lecture at our church. He wanted to present the paper he was presenting at the SSPL to our church members. Randy said to me, Jeremiah, if what I am teaching does not make any sense to black church folk, and I am wasting my time. I don't want to be a scholar who just talks to other scholars with their heady ways of thinking. I want what God is showing me in my research 
to make sense of the folk who sit in the pew week after week. Can I present my paper to them? I said, of course you can. I scheduled it, and then I announced in our church bulletin, had announced from the pulpit for a full month before his revival, that Dr. Randy Bailey will be lecturing here on the last Saturday in September. You don't want to miss his lecture. He is a scholar who reads the Hebrew Bible in the Hebrew language. He is a black man who is an amazing intellectual. I really gave Randy a big hype. After all, he was my classmate and my friend, in addition to being a gargantuan genius. What does this have to do with Jerome Ross? Randy Bailey's lecture that day and before the SSBL was on Moses as an Egyptian who led the Israelites out of slavery. Moses as an Egyptian, Kamite, who led the Israelites out of slavery. One of Dr. Billy's lecture was that we tend to lump folk together as all being the same kind of people. We think of all Egyptians as being slaveholders, mean, evil, and capricious. Pharaoh's army got drowned. An Egyptian was beaten up a Hebrew. We readily forget Shifra and Pua when we lump all Egyptians together. Those were the two comedic midwives who were not killing the baby boys as the president, excuse me, as the pharaoh had ordered. We could quickly forget Hagar, the fine comedic sister who was used by Abraham, abused by Sarah, a victim of gender violence for the father of the faithful. He didn't quit it. Became the, became the archetype of the original biblical baby daddy and abandoned a black teenage mother and a black baby boy and his black son. We quickly forget about those Kamites. We forget about them. But God did not forget about them. God is a God who sees and a God who hears. God is not only El Shaddai and Elohim, God is also El Roy, the God who sees me. We'll come back to that in just a little while. All Egyptians, all the citizens of Kemet were not slaveholders. Some were, but all were not. We also tend to forget all the years when we lumped them together, all Kemites together. Those years that Israelites lived in Kemet before there was slavery and before there arose a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph to use biblical language. Just as slavery is not the beginning of our story, but a chapter in our story, slavery is not the beginning of the Hebrew story. It is only a chapter in their story. I believe we know a little bit about people who look like us who don't think like we think. Did you know that there are some black brothers who are a part of the Proud Boys who can come forward to stand back and stand by? If you did not know that, you do know that there are a whole host of colored preachers who are colored preachers for Trump. You did know that, didn't you? If you didn't know that, you might remember that J.A. Jackson, president of the National Baptist Convention, Dr. Jackson hated Dr. King, Martin Luther King, and barred him from preaching in the National Baptist Convention. You do remember that, don't you? Maybe you know that is how we got a progressive National Baptist Convention. Maybe you know that is why Dr. Gardner C. Taylor had to split along with Martin and others who were too liberal, too political to be a part of the God Bless America National Baptist Convention. I need a favor. Before this virtual lecture series is over, I need somebody to explain something to me.
Why is it that so many black churches have the red, white, and blue flag in their sanctuaries opposite the Christian flag, which is on the other side of their pulpits? What does that flag of war, bombs bursting in air, have to do with the Prince of Peace? Let me leave that alone. Just remember that everybody of your color ain't your kind. And everybody who ain't your color ain't automatically your enemy. Randy's lecture was exciting, and if I had time, I would tell you one or two of the things he lifted up in that lecture that left our church members with their eyes wide open, their eyebrows raised, shocked looks on their faces, and their heads swimming. Dr. Bailey's lecture was about how Moses, whose very name is comedic, that led God's people out of slavery. The first period of oppression is comedic oppression. The second period, Ross points out, is Assyrian oppression. Assyrian oppression is followed by Babylonian oppression by the waters of Babylon. There we sat down and wept. Babylonian oppression is followed by Persian oppression May they, may they take a little parson. Your kingdom has been weighed and found wanting in the balance. Persian oppression is followed by Greek oppression. Greek oppression is followed by Roman oppression. The entire New Testament was written under Roman oppression. One of my favorite passages of New Testament scripture is in Matthew 16, which has Jesus' haunting question that he asked of his disciples and asked of us, who do you say that I am? That passage starts off with the words, they came into the district of Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi. What in the world are you doing with a town in North Africa? A district in North Africa, named after two Roman emperors, Caesar and Philip. Caesar and Philip are not African. They're Italian. They're Roman. Colonizers change the names of the places they colonize, and they change the names of the people they colonize. I also use Jerome Ross's framework, however, to answer Dr. Joseph Evans' question. What is the prophet to preach? What does the prophet proclaim during the aftertimes? I want to submit to you that the prophet is to proclaim what she proclaims at all other times. In fact, the chosen scripture for this year's theme answers the question posed by the lecture planners. What does the prophet proclaim? The prophet proclaims, thus says the Lord. What did the prophet proclaim before the pandemic? Thus says the Lord. What did the prophet proclaim during the pandemic? Thus says the Lord. What does the prophet proclaim after the time of the pandemic? Thus says the Lord. What does the prophet proclaim during different times of political iterations? Thus says the Lord. In Jeremiah's day, as you well know, in biblical days, from the Pharaonic dynasties in Kemet, the Pharaonic Empire in Kemet, to the Roman Empire in Revelation, there was no such thing as a democratic government. There were no such things as elected officials. There was no such thing as politics as you and I know politics today. But in all of those iterations of empire, <laughs> the word of God remains the same. What does the prophet proclaim? Thus says the Lord. When the Pharaoh who asked Moses, who is the Lord, sat on the throne in his empire, God was still God on God's throne in heaven. The Africans enslaved in this country put it this way. God sits high and God looks low. 
God was God before there was a Pharaonic Empire. God was God before there was an Assyrian Empire. God was God before there was a Babylonian Empire. God was God before there was a Nebuchadnezzar, a Cyrus, or a Caesar, whose name in Latin is pronounced Kaiser. God was God before there was a Hitler. God was God before there was a Hayes, to enter into a Hayes tilt and compromise, which put African Americans in the United States back into slavery. God was God before the empire of humans, and God will be God when there are no more humans. What did the prophet proclaim during the Kemetic Empire? On the backside of a mountain in Midian, Moses met our God who said, I am that I am. Thus says the Lord, I was who I was, and I will be who I will be. What did the prophet proclaim during the reign of the Assyrian Empire? Thus says the Lord, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint and to them that hath no might. He increaseth strength. What shall the prophet proclaim? Even the youth shall faint and grow weary and the young men shall utterly fall. But, <laughs> but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. What did the prophet proclaim during the Babylonian empire? Azariah, Hananiah, and Mishael tell us the God we serve the God we serve is able to deliver us, O King. But even if he doesn't, we will not worship the God of the empire. During the Babylonian empire, what did the prophet proclaim? First the prophet asked the question, and then the prophet answered his own question. His question was, why art thou cast down on my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? We are in exile. We are away from the temple in Jerusalem. But listen to the answer. Hope thou in God. Thus saith the Lord, hope thou in God. What did the prophet proclaim during the Persian Empire? During Persian politics and Persian paranoia? Thus saith the Lord, I am the Lord and I change not. I am God. I am that I am. What did the prophet proclaim during the Greek empire from 323 before the Christian era, before the common era, and the period of Alexander the Great down to the ascendancy of the Roman legions? What did the prophet proclaim? Thus says the Lord, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Achad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. God is the same Lord who brooded over the deep in the book of beginnings, and God will still be God when time shall be no more. What did the prophet proclaim during the Roman Empire? The Caesars were so powerful that Julius Caesar had a month named after him. We call it July. Augustus was so powerful that he named a month named after him. We call it August. So what did the prophet proclaim during that period? Thus saith the Lord, he is Lord, he is Lord. The Romans wanted their citizens to say Kaiser is Lord Kyrios. The Christians say, no, he is Lord. The angel of the Lord said to Joseph, and Mary shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done so they might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet. Thus saith the Lord, what shall the prophet proclaim? Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is interpreted God 
with us. Dr. Mitri Rahev constantly reminds us that the word saved and salvation to the Hebrew speaking who read the Hebrew Bible as Jesus read it and who read it today understood and understand salvation to be deliverance physically from oppression. In the Hebrew language and culture, salvation was concretely physical. The empire, however, changed it from being physical into a spiritual concept. Think about it. When David wrote, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? David was not talking about being saved from smoking and drinking, snorting coke, staying out late, having on a dress that was too short, or taking our booties to the poles. David was talking about physical deliverance from the oppressor when the wicked, even my enemies, came upon him. The prophet said, you shall call him Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach. Why? Because Yeshua HaMashiach shall save his people, meaning he shall deliver them from their sins. Their sins are bowing down to the gods of the empire. Emmanuel, which we pronounce Emmanuel, means God is with us. No matter who is on the political throne or whose paranoia makes them pretend to have COVID-19 to get votes and swear an election their way, while ramming an ultra-right-wing female judge down our disbelieving throats. God is with us, Emmanuel, no matter who is on an earthly throne. God is still on the throne. What shall the prophet proclaim? God is still on the throne. Thus says the Lord, I am that I am. Empire does not have the last word. God always has the last word. What did the prophet proclaim before? Slavery, chattel slavery. Thus saith the Lord, in the language of the Akan, Jiyanyami, none but God, none before God, none greater than God, Jiyanyami. No empire, just God. The Akan were declaring their truth long before the missionaries got to the west coast of Africa. During the Ma'afa, Africans were proclaiming the same truth. During the Arab slave trade, yes, Matilda, the Arabs and the Muslims were carrying Africans into slavery long before the Christians got into the game. During the Arab slave trade, the prophets were proclaiming, Alhamdulillah, all praise be to God. The prophets were proclaiming, Alu, Allahu Akbar, God is the greatest. Jiyanyame and Tui. What were the prophets proclaiming? Inshallah, if God wills it, it will be so. Thus says the Lord, I am who I am. I am the Lord, and I change not. Man proposes, but God disposes. 700 years after the Muslim Christians got in on the game and invented the new category, I just called out chattel slavery, property, where they dehumanized Africans to the point where Europeans considered Africans to be property, not people. During the transatlantic slave trade, what were the prophets proclaiming? Thus says the Lord, there is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. There is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole. What was the prophet proclaiming during the transatlantic slave trade? Over my head, I hear music in the air. There must be a God somewhere. During the transatlantic slave trade, what were the prophets proclaiming? Didn't my Lord deliver Daniel? Then why not every man? Why not everyone? During the transatlantic slave trade, what were the prophets proclaiming? Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom over me. Before I be a slave, I be buried in my grave and go home to my God and be free. After slavery was legally discontinued during the period of Reconstruction, 
What did the prophets proclaim? Thus says the Lord, trials dark on every hand, and we do not understand all the ways that God would lead us to that blessed promised land. But God guides us with his eye, and we'll follow till we die, and we'll understand it better by and by. During the Hayes Tilden Compromise, the abandonment of the rights of African citizens in the South during that awful period, that heinous period, that horrible period of lynching. Convict lease system, where a black party during lynching became strange fruit swinging from the poplar trees in the South. What did the prophets proclaim? Stony the road we trod, bit of the chastening rod felt in the days when hope unborn had died yet with a steady beat. Have not our weary feet come to the place for which our parents sighed during the long night of Jim Crow and legal segregation in this land? What did the prophets proclaim? They proclaimed, I love the Lord, he heard my cry. What did the prophet proclaim? Life for me ain't been no crystal stair, but I keep climbing, I still climbing. Why, mama? Because the Lord will make a way somehow. Why you keep quoting these poets? Walter Brueggemann says, finally comes the poet. The prophet is a poet. Jeremiah was a poet. Isaiah was a poet. Ezekiel was a poet. When Emmett Till was lynched, what did the prophets proclaim? Though a day so bright begun, clouds may hide the noonday sun, wickedness a while may reign, and Satan's cause may seem to gain, but there is a God who rules above with hand of power and heart of love. And if I'm right, he'll fight my battle. I shall be free someday. When Mega Evers was murdered, when Malcolm X was murdered, when Martin King was murdered, when the pandemic of racism ran rapid over this globe, what did the prophet proclaim? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid when the wicked and my enemies come upon me to eat up my flesh? Gianyami, nobody but God. When Sandra Bland, Kimia Rice, George Floyd, and Breonna Taylor were murdered, what did the prophet proclaim? And what are the prophets proclaiming? I submit to you the prophets will proclaim the same after the pandemic, after the police demic, after the Confederacy on parade, and after the Proud Boys finish standing back and stand by, they will proclaim God is, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. I submit to you that the messes, the messes, M-E-S-S-E-S, -S -E -S, the messes have changed. But the message is the same. God is our hope. God is our help. God is the joy and the strength of our lives. We are called to stand against empire and to bring empire down. The coronavirus is a deadly reminder that all flesh is grass. It's all the same. Trump's flesh is grass. His flesh is the same as our flesh. Trump's flesh will be cut down from unknown microbodies that are equal opportunity murderers, the coronavirus is a deadly reminder. But where the coronavirus is a deadly reminder that all flesh is grass, God is a life-giving reminder. His name is Emmanuel, Emmanuel, Emmanuel. His name is Jesus, Yeshua, Ha, Mashiach. God will deliver us from empire. If we walk with God, we can tear down the walls of empire. What shall the prophet proclaim? Not by power 
nor by might, but thus saith the Lord, by my spirit, we can usher in a new day. Jesus came to tear down empire. God has already told us what is good, to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk wherever God is walking. Jesus walked where God was walking in his day. Jesus walked in his day in the places that church folk would not be called dead in. Where is God walking today? I submit to you, he's walking in the streets with the Black Lives Matter protester. If our gospel does not line up with Black Lives Matter, then we are like Jeremiah's contemporaries who preached peace, peace, where there was no peace. God has shown us what is good to do justice. Put it another way. Put another way, said differently means no justice, no peace. Wherever empire stands to dehumanize human beings made in the image of God, God is walking to show that God is more powerful than any human empire. A holy, holy God is more powerful than any human empire. The comedic empire fell. My friend and brother Anthony Brown, Browder is now doing archaeological digs where they would not let William Leo Hansberry dig. Dr. Browder is trying to resurrect reminders of what the comedic empire was, what it looked like back in the day. But where the comedic empire is no more, God is still, I am. The Assyrian empire is no more. The Babylonian empire is no more. The Persian empire is no more. The Greek empire is no more. There's not one person at this moment, at this virtual convocation, unless there are scholars in Mediterranean culture, almost nobody present can tell you who the civil emperor of the Roman Empire is in 2020. Why? Because just like the Comedic Empire fell, just like the Assyrian Empire fell, just like the Babylonian Empire fell, just like the Persian Empire fell, just like the Greek Empire fell, the Roman Empire also fell. The psalmist put it this way, the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of our Lord, and he shall reign forever and ever. Hallelujah. My charge to you who carry the cross of Jesus is to make your preaching live by preaching God's truth. Thus saith the Lord, all flesh is grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord is forever. It stands forever. God is El Shaddai. God is I am that I am. God is Elohim. God is El Roy, the God who sees me, which is why the Zulu greeting, Sawabona, I see you, has such rich meaning. What shall the prophet proclaim? Thus saith the Lord, when it's all over, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Thank you for your time and your prayerful attention. Ashe and Amen.